Hello and welcome to the program. My name is Marcus Carlson and today I'm speaking to the executive chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt. We've been invited along to uh, Google's new headquarters here in Paris. So the company has spent an estimated 150 million euros to buy this site and it's to house what Google itself calls a European cultural center. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Mr. Schmidt, for, for speaking to us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's start talking about this, the building th that we're in. You've got other investments uh, coming up as well here in Europe, along with a, uh, a Google ac Academy uh, in, in, in Germany, and you're also hiring a lot more engineers and other staff members here in Europe. Are you on a European charm offensive? Well, we've already made a, a decision to invest heavily in Europe because it's good business, not just for charm. And indeed, we announced that we were going to hire more than 1,500 people in Europe at the beginning of this year, and maybe even more. We're on track to do that and more. And to invest in local content, local culture, improving the state of dialogue about the internet, and doing it with the appropriate thought leaders and industry leaders and academic leaders in each of the countries. Mm -hmm. This center is the, going to be the hub of our European cultural center where and who who but the French to understand the importance and the magnificence of, of European culture uh, and we need their support to make sure that that culture and that content is available on Google. But do you have an image problem here, here in Europe because you've been undergoing criminal investigation in Germany because of alleged uh, privacy breaches. Uh, you've also been accused of cultural imperialism here in France because you've been digitizing digitizing books. Uh, as I say, do you have an image problem in this continent? Well, most of our surveys indicate that people love Google. So, for example, in Germany, after we've completed the Street View uh, driving, which was the subject of various complaints from the government, it turns out that it's by far the most popular thing that Germans do is to use Street View. So we make our decisions based on what our testing and what our surveys indicate the citizens of these countries care about. And what we know is that they care about more Google information, more local information, more content in their language, whether it's video or, or information about their country or their culture or entertainment. So you're not scared of, of the future here in Europe and the, the, the need, so to speak, to, to improve your brand? Well, the brand, of course, tests very, very strongly. Indeed, one of the best brands in the world. And the fact of the matter is that Google benefits from our global presence. We benefit from our business in Europe. Uh, many of our profits come from the fact that the European uh, currency is so strong relative to the dollar. So we're here to stay. We're here to invest. Uh, and this building, the commitment we've made, you see it all is very, very real. Now, you're here in Paris to participate in the EG8 Forum, which uh, brings together internet leaders from around the world and also politicians. It's uh, connected to the French presidency of the G8 and G20. Some people say that the EG8 is just a ploy by the French government to dress up its wish to uh, regulate uh, internet, uh, the, the internet. Uh, what do you say about that criticism? I think that's an unfair criticism of the French government. Uh, if you go back to 10 years ago, the French were very far behind in broadband penetration and internet use, perhaps because of the history of the Minitel. If you go back 10 years ago, it did not look like the French would modernize in the same way that the Germans and the British and the Scandinavians did. But in the last few years, we've seen an acceleration of broadband penetration to the point where France is one of the leading in countries in the world with broadband access. So I think the French have a proper role in shaping the future of the internet. Uh, in the conversations today, there's not been an argument, a strong argument in favor of regulation. Uh, the president made the argument over and over again that he wanted rights of both groups protected. And he pointed out that he'd heard a lot from the copyright owners and the content owners, and he wanted to hear more from the internet, internet societies as a whole. So he appears to be listening to both sides, which we think is good for a politician. You refer that to, to your conversation with the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy. You're not scared that he and the other G8 leaders and G20 leaders will take your regulation too, too far. What's the risk of that? Well, we're always worried about excessive reg regulation and ex excessive regulation that sh somehow shut down this expansion of the internet would be disastrous for the world because so many people are uh, relying on the internet today. Studies that were released today indicate that the European economy is somewhere between 8 and 10 percent internet centric now. Literally mm -hmm. the GDP of Europe, if you will, is that sensitive to what's going on in the internet. So we've cautioned against excess regulation. I'm sure there will be some additional regulation simply because of the role of the internet, but I'm pretty hopeful 
that through all of these conversations, through our commitment to France and to Germany and so forth, that it'll be balanced. Now, one of the reasons that there is talk about more regulation here in Europe in particular is the, the, the privacy concerns when it comes to, to Google. Some people say that Google knows way too much about its clients and perhaps that it can use th that information for, for, for bad purposes. Uh, wh what do you say about that? Well, of course, our commitment is that we won't do that. Uh, to start with, the company was founded on a set of principles which we hold today around privacy. Don't be evil, you're talking about your slogan. And, so and, we, and we focus very much on that. But a much more fundamental point is that privacy should be under your control to the degree that we can make it. And we have published now a dashboard so that you can see what Google information has about you and that to the degree that we can control it, you can then delete that information. But seeing, once again, what Google knows about us as, as customers, do you understand that there is a certain reticence uh, among your customer base or that there is uh, starting to emerge such a reticence? I certainly understand the concern, but the data that we have indicated that people are using Google more and more. So they must be comfortable with our assurance of their privacy and their ability to control the information that we have. Uh, the Internet and its future is also one of the main topics during the EG8. How do you think the Internet is going to develop uh, in the next 10 or 20 years? It's exploded uh, just in the past uh, decade. Do you think it will grow as rapidly in the next 10 years? I looked at this recently and I'm astounded to say that we're at the beginning of this age of the Internet that we have many years of growth ahead of us as we get more fully connected. Here are some examples. A couple billion people who are not on the internet will join the internet in the next three to five years because of mobile phones and so forth. Virtually everything that you see in traditional computing will be moved into what are called cloud servers or accessible over the internet with appropriate security. Whole new generations of applications and companies will be formed to provide end user services about where you are, what you'd like to buy, where you'd like to go, how you can buy things, new forms of electronic commerce, new opportunities for entrepreneurship and new businesses. Uh, we're just at the very beginning of what you can do with these platforms. And how will Google develop alongside the, the, the Internet? What's your short to medium term plan when it comes to growth? Well, one of the underlying facts of the Internet has been the massive expansion of data. And there's simply so much data that no one, no matter how bright and industrious you are, can keep up with the explosion of data that you care about. This is a search problem. So the good news is that with this massive expansion of data comes an even greater need for companies like Google to provide search services. We're trying to transition from the traditional answers of the forms of just links to really giving you higher quality answers. And with your permission, if you sign in and tell, you, tell, tell us who you are, we can probably provide you even more targeted results. Who's your main competitor, competitor uh, at the moment? Uh, Facebook is seen to be eating up more and more advertising revenue on, on the internet. Is Facebook your number one threat at this stage? Um, absolutely not. Um, the competitor that we deal with every day is Microsoft. And Microsoft did a partnership with Yahoo, who was the other competitor. So effectively, it's a Google and Microsoft world where those are the two main choices. And Microsoft is investing very, very heavily in search technology and advertising technology. Um, with respect to Facebook, it, this is a very, very large market, and it looks to me like all forms of return on investment advertising are doing well. Uh, it's a misnomer to think that somehow mm -hmm. everybody's competing for the same dollars or euros. In fact, there's a shift from non-measurable advertising to measurable advertising, which, of course, Google excels at. We benefit from that shift, as do other companies like Facebook. But we got news recently that a, that a PR firm admitted that it had been hired by, by Facebook to, to smear Google to, to, to uh, come out with a PR campaign against you. Facebook certainly seems to be thinking that you're its number one threat. Well, I can't speak for Facebook. Um, I did see the emails and I did see the statements that they made and they're not true. All right, let, let's move on a little bit about to your to your personal position at, at Google. You've just gone from being chief executive to, to executive chairman. Larry Page, one of the uh, Google's right. founders, has now taken over as chief executive. What, what's your role at this stage? Well, Larry and I, of course, have worked together literally every day for a decade, literally seven days a week. So this realignment of roles works well for both of us. It allows Larry to focus on what he is truly brilliant at, which is a tremendous product visionary and operational manager. And it allows me to spend as much time as possible evangelizing with partners, working with governments, working on public policy and the things that I care so much about. So, so far, it's worked extremely well.
But you said a few years ago that you came in at a stage when Google needed adult supervision. The Doesn't boy... Google need <laughs> adult supervision anymore? No, all? it's shocking. The boys have grown up. <laughs> and in fact, uh, Larry and Sergey are accomplished executives now. They've spent a decade building a multi-billion dollar corporation. I think that they deserve every credit for what they have accomplished. I'm very happy to have them running things. Now, you referred to Microsoft a, a, a while back or a few moments ago. Ten years ago, they were the king of the hill. Now you're the king of the hill, so to speak, in the internet world. Aren't you scared that you're going to follow the same example as, as, as Microsoft and walk in its footsteps, so to speak? Well, we try not to follow Microsoft on anything. But the fact of the matter is that the fear that you're describing is what propels the leadership of Google to continue focusing on innovation. The answer to the problem of middle age, if you will, in high-tech companies, which mm -hmm. is the one you're describing, which has befallen Microsoft and others over time, is a constant focus on innovation around consumers. The fact of the matter is that the internet opportunity before us is very different from the internet opportunity that was before us 10 years ago. And if we fail to adapt, if we fail to take advantage of this opportunity, we deserve what happens to us. Eric Schmidt, it's been very interesting to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed uh, for taking the time. And thank you very much. And thanks to you at home as well for watching. Stay with us here at France 24. <laughs>